Our scripture reading this morning comes from the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 1, verses 18 through 24. Now the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife. This is the word of God for the people of God. God. Amen. Let us go to God in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this time to come together in worship and in praise and thanksgiving and fellowship. We pray that you would open our hearts and open our ears that the words that are about to be spoken be your words for your people, that bring us into a better relationship with you and a better understanding of what it is that you demand of us. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Well, this morning we get to continue our journey to the manger scene by focusing on yet another main character of the manger. Today, we're going to be focusing on Joseph. The man who will eternally and forever be known as Jesus' other dad. Now, quick, rack your brain real quick. How much do you know about this man of faith? Probably not a lot. The scriptures are almost silent on him, except for the few verses that we read this morning from Matthew. And a few verses in the Gospel of Luke that very easily depict him as a very neglectful father when he left the 12-year-old Jesus in Jerusalem in the temple. Other than that, he is not mentioned at all throughout the rest of the scriptures. Last week, we spoke about someone who is mentioned many times in the scriptures. Mary, the mother of Jesus how famous she is and how well-known she is, even to Protestants and Catholics alike, even to the non-believers of the world. Mary, the Virgin Mary, is still well-known. Joseph, on the other hand, we can say very little of. Now the question then becomes, as much as we know about Mary and as much as we know about the faith and trust that she had in God, Can we say the same about the man who would raise Jesus with just the little bit of information that we have through the scriptures? And I believe that we can. And I think that at some level, we find a little bit more about Joseph. In the story this morning, we find that Joseph is contacted by an angel in a dream concerning his future ex-wife and his immediate future. You know, when the angel arrives in Joseph's dream, the angel brings something that is important for any day. But today, since we just lit the candle of peace on the Advent wreath, and we have been speaking about peace as we get closer to the manger scene, what the angel brings to Joseph is God's peace. And so Jesus, uh, jo- Joseph is able to do something extraordinary rather than what he had already planned to do, which was, at just the very least, merciful. When the angel came to Joseph in a dream, if you, re- if you listened real carefully, you noticed Joseph had already made up his mind. Joseph already knew about the child. He knew that it couldn't be his. And he already had made up his mind as to how he was going to handle the situation that he had been presented with. A woman whom he had been betrothed to, who had, in every sense of the word, betrayed by getting pregnant. 
certainly knowing that it wasn't his. He could have felt anger or resentment or betrayal or hurt. And yet Joseph, before the angel even shows up, Joseph shows us a piece of his character. Joseph's initial reaction is mercy. He chooses that after viewing the whole situation, it is best to keep Mary out of the spotlight. To save her from the crowds. As we talked about last week, you know what the penalty was for adultery in that world. Joseph did not wish to see Mary stoned. He did not wish to see Mary's family shamed by their society. And so Joseph chooses to make it quiet, to not bring her out into the public eye, to divorce her, but to do it in such a way that they could save face, that she could keep her life, and that he could move on. This is what has already transpired by the time the dream appears in Joseph's story. Now, for so long, I've always believed that peace was simply the absence of conflict. How many of you all think that that's exactly what the definition of peace is? The absence of conflict. We think about it all the time in the world, don't we? we probably wouldn't say that the Middle East is the most peaceful area. However, we might say the same thing about certain streets in Houston. Peace seems to be the place where we don't see violence and we don't see hatred and we don't see guns or anything else. Peace is the absence of the conflict that is there. But, and if we stop at that definition, then let me ask you a question. Why do we sing so proudly and so at the top of our lungs that Jesus is the Prince of Peace? When 2,000 years after his birth, this world has not gotten any closer to peace. You turn on the news, you listen to the radio. You read the newspaper, heck, you log on to Facebook and you will find human travesty, human cruelty, natural disasters, even small little annoyances of daily life, all of which have the incredible likeliness to succeed in stealing peace. The world, and, and in all fairness, the world has gotten so small too. Technology has bound us together. We know what happened in China yesterday, this morning. We know what happened in all the state, 50 states because we can turn on ABC or NBC or CNN or anything else. We can speak to our families and friends that are days of journey away in mere seconds. The world has become so small that peace can be a thing that we never really have anymore. And if it really is true that peace, at least peace in this traditional understanding, can't be achieved, then why is it that we speak about it and hold it in such high regards, especially in this time? All of us can agree that the Advent season getting prepared for Christmas is not the stress-free environment that we'd love to have. Why is it that we hold this word above all others? The four candles on the Advent wreath represent four words, the four words of Christmas. Peace, hope, love, and joy. These are the things we find at the manger. These are the things that Jesus came to bring to the world. And I have to believe that of the four words that I just, described, that I just said, peace has got to be the one that seems the hardest to come by in this world. So what does that mean for us? Does it mean that we have to hold ourselves up 
become hermits, cut ourselves off from every media outlet, every cell phone, every person, except for those that will bring us peace that we don't have any conflict with, which probably is no one. And that's probably not going to work very well, is it? Maybe the statement is that we just have to endure this world until Christ comes again. Peace may just be something that's too idealistic for this world. But then I go back to the scriptures and I read that God promises peace. That Jesus promised peace. My peace I give to you. Well, if Jesus promises that he's giving us peace, then he must be talking about a different kind of peace. And I find that peace is something that we truly can experience once I start to realize that Jesus is talking about a different kind. And we experience this peace even when, we get, even when we're watching the Facebook feeds and the news reports about the devastating fire in California or the massive earthquake that happened in Alaska or the 53rd mass shooting that's happened in the country, whichever number we may be on at this point. But it all depends on the definition of peace that we have. Is it the world's definition of peace that says that it is simply the absence of conflict? Or is it what God has promised us? So if you look back at the story in Matthew, the story of Joseph, the small little snippet of his life that we do get to see. Where is the peace that I'm talking about? Joseph seems to have come to the worldly, peaceful solution here, hasn't he? I'm going to divorce Mary. I'm not going to submit her to public shame. I'm not going to submit her family to public shame. I'm not going to have her stoned, which I very easily could do. It seems that everything that Joseph has decided about Mary's fate and his involvement in it has everything about the peaceable nature. There's no conflict. There's no violence. It's a simple divorcing, quietly and under the table and done. Joseph goes his way. Mary goes the other way. Mary's family probably figures out how to hide the pregnancy or ship her somewhere else that no one will see the pregnancy and no one will be the wiser. And then we get the angel who comes in and takes Joseph's acceptable reaction with the acceptance of the societal ramifications and standards and throws it to the wind and says, nope, I want you to do something that is going to bring ultimate shame on you and her and your families and create massive amounts of conflict. Now, where is the peace that God has promised in that option? The fact is it's in the words. It's in the words that the angel gives to Joseph. But so many of us can't hear it because we're not looking for this kind of peace. Now, I was doing uh, some of my research getting ready for the sermon this morning and uh, one of the books that I have in my library is it's kind of like a dictionary. Basically, you can go into it with a, with a word or a phrase, and it'll give you scriptures that pertain to it, uh, love or, or things of that nature. And I looked up peace. And when I looked up peace, it was right in between two other words. The first one was patience, and the second was peer pressure. You want to know why they put it there? It's alphabetical. <laughs> but I think that the author's unintendedly gave us something really important there. That peace is right there. Let me read a passage from the King David. The 122nd Psalm. This is what David prays for. He says, Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. 
peace be within your walls and security within your towers. For the sake of my relatives and friends, I will say, peace be within you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your good. Now, to understand what David is talking about here, I want to put it in a different way. David is telling us that peace is more than just the absence of conflict. Peace, God's peace, what he has promised us through Jesus, through everything else in the scriptures, is wholeness with God. Justice, protection, and prosperity from the one who can actually deliver those things. Simply put, peace is knowing that the God of the entire universe is behind you. That the God of the entire universe is the one who has called you to do whatever it is that you are supposed to do. Are you starting to see how Joseph is a man that exemplifies peace? Joseph shows us what it's like to have the peace of God. A peace that makes even the hardest decision simple. Now, what I don't want you to start thinking is that Joseph's choice to not divorce Mary was an easy one. It was the hardest choice he could have ever had to make. It was the hardest choice out of all the different possibilities that he could have gone with in his situation. Last week I told you Mary knew the consequences of her sta statement of yes. Mary knew what was going to happen to her or the possibility of what was going to happen to her when she said, I will conceive your son. When she invited the Holy Spirit in and said, as you have said, let it be done. Mary knew what the consequences could be of those words. And she had the faith and trust in God that those consequences would not come to light. Joseph, on the same hand, knew also. He knew what he was getting himself into with the society that surrounded him if he continued down the path that God had asked him to continue down. We'll see that a little bit later when we get to the manger scene of what this choice cost him. Now, let me try and, and bring this into a, a, a different example for those of you that are still having a little bit difficult time of understanding this idea of God's peace and help see that God's peace gave Joseph the ability to make the most difficult choice. When I was younger, in high school and junior high, I played football for four years which meant that there was a lot of time I spent in the weight room. When I would go into the weight room to figure out what I was going to lift for that particular day, one of the things that I would have to put in my mind is, who's my spotter? If the person who's spotting me is about my same weight class and my same strength, or maybe a little less of strength, then I'm going to put less weight on the bar because I know that I'm going to have to be doing a lot of the lifting. But... If I knew that my good friend who had put records in the weight room for lifting was going to be my spotter, I could put more weight on the bar. I could take a bigger risk with my weight because I knew that if I couldn't handle it, he could. God's peace is like this. God goes to Joseph. Joseph has looked at the weight of his decisions. And he has decided that the weight of divorcing Mary quietly and walking away from the situation is weight enough for him. The angel comes to him and, sa and God tells him, I'm your spotter. Now knowing that, what kind of weight do you think you can lift? Joseph felt that by himself, he could, bear, he could holster the burden of the quiet divorce. Because the fact of the matter is, he still would have gotten some snide remarks, some sideways glances from his family members and friends of why he didn't 
bring her to the law. Why he didn't exact the correct amount of justice. And so he felt I could, he could handle that. But then God comes and Joseph believes with God's peace, he chooses to go with the heaviest route, the hardest route, because he knows that when it gets too hard, when it gets too heavy, God will be there to take care of it. Joseph has no fear that the weight will crush him because God is the one that has his hands ready. Now listen to what this means for us. Because the fact of the matter is that God says the same thing to us as he says to Joseph in the dream. My way is heavier, but your way will force you to do it alone. Why do you think that when Jesus talks to the disciples and he talks to us through the gospel accounts, he says, my yoke is light. My way is easy. Why does he think, why does he say that? Because he understands that while his choices, the choices that he wants you to make are the most difficult choices you will ever encounter. The difference is, is that if you make them on your own, if you try to make the easier route, you're going by yourself. And you only can rely on your own strength. But when we take his choice, when we take his will and we move by his way, he promises to walk with us. He promises to bolster the weight by himself. And his strength is unlimited. Joseph is a man who gets so little play in the scriptures. Even if we counted the whole passage from today and the whole passage from Luke, it would mean that Joseph has 15 verses in total of the entire Bible. And yet it's this story of Joseph, the peace that he shows to us in his choice. He was no great saint. He was no great thinker or genius or amazing man of faith or God, but he listened to a dream of an angel. He understood that God stood behind him. And he said yes. He took the step of faith and he walked in that path. The hardest decision, I'm sure, of his entire life. And Joseph shows us that peace is to be found when we follow God's calling and realize that when God calls us, he never calls us to go alone. He is always and forever beside us. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, it is so easy in this world that we live in with all the conflict and wars and violence and media outlets and everything else to be wary of the word peace. It is a word that we don't find very much of. And yet, it is a word that we're supposed to assimilate with the manger scene. The prince of peace coming into this world. Your son promising to give us peace. And so many times we look and we ask, where is it? Where can we find this peace? And Father, we pray that you would give us better eyes. That we would understand that your version of peace, your definition of peace, doesn't mean that there's no conflict. Doesn't mean that there's no violence. It means that we have the peace within us to know that where we are going, who we are traveling with, and what we are doing. 
is being called on by the one who created all of us, by the one who loves us, and by the strongest entity imaginable, that we might have the clarity and the peace to do what you have called us to do, no matter how difficult it may seem, because you will always be with us. And so, Father, I pray that you would give to us that understanding, that you would send your Holy Spirit upon us, that we might understand the kind of peace that the manger brings to us. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen.